in looking at Tomboya as one of the founders of the Kenyan nation, we must appreciate that no history of Kenya can be written without mentioning Tomboya. And Tomboya, when you look at him uh, uh, across uh, from the perspective of other places like South Africa, he can be equated to or compared to Sergio Ramaphosa of South Africa, a man who came from a very small ethnic group, the Suba, who, who are absorbed by the rule of Kenya. Uh, and of course now he's seen like a rule, but he's a Suba with Lama Fossa, who comes from one of the smallest communities in South Africa, the Venda, as opposed to Zuru, who are more or less 10% of the country, if not more, or the Kosa, or Swana. And uh, he is that man who never went to either exile or prison or fighting for independence, just as the case of Silio Lamaphosa. So that's how he comes in. But when you look at his uh, political activities, he may compare with either Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, or Thomas Sankala. In case he became a president, he could have possibly compared with Nkrumah or Thomas Sankala. Looking at his age, his youthfulness, and all that. Now, something else to consider about Tomboya is that uh, uh, Tomboya rose uh, from one level to the other within a very short time, a succession of uh, time, a succession of events. Starting from 1939, when he was barely nine years, when his father, Leonard uh, Diege, took him to uh, missionary school, the Roman Catholic missionary schools in Ukambani in 1939. Boya went on becoming everything from the president of the student body and uh, uh, to other positions like, say, an inspector of uh, the medical uh, officers, other medical officers in Nairobi way back in 1950 when he was buried. Uh, 20 years, to becoming a member of parliament at the age of 27, that is 1958, when he became one of the eight members of parliament, who included Jaramogi, uh, Masinda Moriro, uh, Ronald Gara, Daniel Moy, James Mwimi of uh, Southern Constituency, uh, talk of Daniel Moy of Left Valley, talk of Roland Sagini of Nyanza South, uh, those eight people, those pioneer eight, he was one of them at 27, perhaps the youngest man those days. And even in the Parliament or the Regis Legislative Council, which was then called uh, Regico, it was abbreviated Legico or Parliament then, but now, but then Legislative Council. He was appointed the Secretary uh, of the African Caucus, uh, which was called African Erected Members Organization, AEMO. And he continued campaigning for independence as well as seeking freedom for Jomo Kenyatta, uh, the Kapenguria Six, and other political detainees and prisoners across the country. And uh, as a powerful and perfect diplomat, he reached out to other nations, particularly after 1952 when uh, KU was banned on 20th. Uh, October 1952, when KU was banned, the rights of Jomo Kenyatta were arrested and detained and finally jailed. Uh, Tomboya took over as the person who was actually the voice, who used his voice as a trade unionist 
to reach out to the whole world to explain the situation of Kenya at that time. It was now Boya talking. So from 1952 onwards, it was Boya talking. Although even when he went to Britain for studies, further studies, uh, he still continued in the crusade against colonialism. You remember even 1955, Boya got a scholarship uh, to stand the trade union, trade union matters at Raskin College, where he studied industrial management. He went on more of a Kenyan nationalist. And even after graduation in 1956, his return to Kenya gave him a chance to continue with the politics on a full-time basis. That is what Boya did. Something else. When he was a member of the Legislative Council since 1957, he exploited um, the Renox Boyd Constitution that came in 1957 and more or less gave for more freedom to Africans, as opposed to the Ritterton, Ritterton Constitution that brought them to Parliament, the eight of them, when the Africans were for the first time around or around to be erected as members of Regisericia. Boyer used the Renox Boyd Constitution to press for more members of Parliament or Legislative Council. And that is what brought the rights of Jeremiah Nyaga, Gikonyo Kiano, in the 1958 um, little general elections, because there were six uh, positions handed for Africans, making it 14. So we could now talk of 14 Europeans. 14 Africans could talk of uh, uh, six Asians, something of the sort. But even though Africans did not get the 50% that they were craving for, at least they had an added figure now that Boya fought very hard to get it move up front. Uh, something else we can say about Boya is that uh, although he didn't go to, he was not part of the Kapenguria Six, he did as much as, he, as they did when he was now a trade unionist. In fact, he could have done more or just like them. Because um, it is Boya who moved across the world as a trade unionist and racing conferences. Sometimes you find Boya and racing civil rights uh, campaigns in America with Martin Luther King and it, using that opportunity to address the international media and exposing the settlers' brutality, exposing the destruction of young boys who are calling themselves freedom fighters. The Mau Mau, he was the one now telling the country, our house is on fire. Somebody is overdoing things. He's not getting it light, and that is where Boya scores a credit. Remember, in 1958, at the age of 28, uh, he was elected the chairman of the of African People's Conference in Ghana uh, when Kwame Nkrumah convened that meeting. Is the one who appeared more charismatic in that Pan African Congress held in Ghana. And it is from there that even people started taking him very seriously in Kenya, more seriously than before. They realized this is a man now who is set for great things from 1958 onwards. Remember, he was only 28, but he could do more. Something else is the convention of the first of Africa uh, trade union. That is the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, ICFTU. That was convened and, uh, by Boya. That is in 1959 when this gentleman, Boya, Thomas, Tom Boya, Thomas Joseph Boya, called a conference in Lagos, Nigeria, to form the first of Africa uh, International Conference of Free Trade Unions, ICFTU, Reba Organization. And uh, 
Mboya went on and, as I've noted, gave speeches, particularly he participated in debates and interviews across the world in favor of Kenya's independence from the British colonial rule. As the Secretary, Secretary General of the Kenya uh, Federation of Labor, KFL, the umbrella body for trade unions in Kenya, Boyan gave speeches in London and Washington, D.C., opposing British colonial rule in Kenya. He also organized, uh, Boya also organized several strikes seeking better working conditions for African workers. So that was Boya. At that point, the colonial government nearly closed down the labor movement in the effort to suppress his activities. Boya reached out to other labor leaders across the world, more so in the ICFTU, that is the International Body for Trade Unions, including America, a man, an American man, including an American man by name Philip Radoff, with whom he was very close with his Philip, Philip Landoff. Boya raised funds to build headquarters for the Kenya Federation of Labor. That we see today, it is Boya who raised the funds, not to benefit himself, but to benefit the entire country. Um, now, we've noted that Boya spoke or made speeches, several speeches, during the civil rights campaigns. So he spoke at several rallies in the goodwill of the civil rights movement in the United States. He teamed up with Martin Luther King Jr. during the civil rights crusades as a trade unionist in a country where political activities were outlawed. He used that opportunity to tell the world about the situation that obtained uh, in the colonial Kenya. Something very interesting is that Tom Boya in 1960, at uh, Bayer 30 years, when he was just 30 years old, he was the first Kenyan to be featured on the front page cover of the Time magazine uh, in a painting by Bernard Safran. Yeah, and where inside the, the, the Times magaz magazine, uh, he was extorted or explained or given as a very potential leader of Africa, not just Kenya, but a great African leader. Sometimes it would appear like he will surpass uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the one who had come out as a person speaking the African agenda. So Boya looked like he could as well overtake Kwame Nkrumah if given a chance. Now, something else about Boya is the Kennedy airlifts of the 1960s. What are these Kennedy airlifts? Now, these Kennedy airlifts came when um, Boya teamed up with Martin Luther King, the civil rights leader, President John F. Kennedy, to start preparing Kenya for independence. Now, Boya, a very realistic man, realized something, that without educated people, you don't have a country. If the Europeans or the settlers would be pushed out of the country, we need to train pe people as professionals, as agriculturalists, as lawyers, as economists, as engineers, as mercurial scientists, as farmers, skilled farmers, uh, as uh, technologists of various chains. And that's when he started raising funds in, con uh, in collaboration or, uh, or by working together with John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King and others to create educational opportunities for these African students who would take over from the Europeans. An effort that resulted in the Kennedy airlift of these 1960s. That enabled East African students to study in American 
uh, colleges, universities, and the like. Notable beneficiaries of this Kennedy airlift include Wangari Madhai, the first African woman, African woman Nobel laureate of 2004, and Balaka, and Balaka Obama Sr., the father of the former U.S. President, Barack Obama. It is Boya who created those people who, are, who makes Kenya a, a renowned country besides uh, the best uh, in athletics, Kenya having the best in athletics. We also talk of Wangari Madai as our heroine. We also talk of Barack Obama who became a president of America. Among other people, it is Boya who was uh, who is critical in their formation. Without Boya, we don't know how Kenya would be or where such people would have come from who makes Kenya shine globally. Indeed, this African nationalist, Thomas Joseph Boyer, coordinated a airlift in 1959 of 81 Kenyan students to the USA to attend American colleges and universities as a preparatory measure for Kenya's independence. With the help of Dr. King, the African American Students Foundation and its sponsors, Harry Beramfort, Jackie Robinson, and Sidney Poitra, Boyer raised sufficient funds, a lot of money, to cover the students' travel expenses. Now, one of the students was a certain Barack Hussein Obama Sr., the late fathers of Barack Obama, and Wangari Mother, who became the first African woman Nobel laureate for her crusade against environmental uh, injustices. So that is it. Something else to comment about Boya is that his pre independence relationship with John F. Kennedy is the reason why uh, we have the characters such as uh, Wangari, Madai, and other people, 81 people, who really shaped the Kenya we see today. It is Boya who really planned for it when the Kapenguria Six were in detention. Boya was busy planning how Kenya would be in a very pat patriotic way. Something else we need to underline that it is uh, the arrest of the Kapenguria Six and generally the, the Mau Mau soup of 20th October 1952 and the burning of Kenya African National Union Party that saw Boya rise to the top, uh, top echelon of society as he turned to the, uh, to the use of trade union to further political agenda for the country, for the good of the country. And he was subsequently erected the Secretary General, the Secretary General of Kenya Federation of Labor, KFL, which is the umbrella body, umbrella trade, trade union body of trade unions in Kenya. Um, something else uh, is that um, if Boya was not we mean assassinated on 5th July 1969 what would he have become? That's a question. What would Boya be today? We are talking of 2023. Uh, 2023, Boya will still be there as an old man, assuming God will not have called him naturally. If he was not assassinated at, at that nine, he would have become a key player in the Kenyatta succession in 1978. Having participated in the making of Lancaster House con Constitution, Boya would have insisted on a democratic process so as to replace the departed president. 
and being the most charismatic leader in post-independent Kenya, the most charismatic, the then Attorney General Charles Jonjo would not have opposed Boya. It said that if Jojo was not opposing Boya and that the Minister for Economic Planning, former Minister for Constitutional Affairs, would have an edge. Of course, you cannot tell who would have beaten the other. Between the acting president, Moi, now acting for 90 days, and the boy, the very charismatic man, who was more or less tribress in the Kenyan political market. You can't tell who would have beaten the other. The, with Jojo supporting charismatic people like Boya, because Jojo had a rest is for a boy. So it's it would have been a very tough contest between President Moy and Boya. So personally, I foresee a situation where Kenya would have had a robust democracy in December 1978 after three years of Moy's acting as a president, with Boya as one of the leading presidential candidates. I foresee a more vibrant presidential campaign than what we witnessed in 1992, 2002, and 2022. It would have been vibrant without Boya. Being a brilliant speaker, brilliant organizer, courageous man, uh, all that, Boya would have given a chase to the acting president, Moy. Whoever would have won, it is Kenyans who have decided the winner. There is no other person, whether, whether JM would have tried also. It's a hard task to say uh, who, between Moy, JM, or Boya, who would have beaten the other. But Boya seems like he had a head start. Because of his treacherous nature, he, he appears he could have been uh, the person with a head start. Um, at 48, of, obviously, because Boya would have been 48 years old by 1978, by December 1978, Tom Boya would have provided a Leo presidential contest and most probably win. Certainly, Tom Boyer's presidential working manifesto was released at the age of 33 in 1963. So to me, Boyer was the most prepared presidential candidate in Kenya. Because when he released his book in 1963, at the age of 33, the book is entitled Tom Boyer, Freedom and After. A 12-chapter book which details his thinking for Africa, for Kenya, for the world, the foreign policy, Boya had released his manifesto. So we could predict where he would have gone, what he could have done. You can read a very interesting book about Boya's writing it himself at that age, a very mature book. There is no other comprehensive book about Kenya's history and more realistic than Boya's book, Freedom and After. Freedom and After is a book Kenyans need to read today written or published by East African Education Publishers in 1963, but still, still talking about what Kenya needs and how problems of Kenya, including ethnic tensions, they are well uh, 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 explained by Boya. It's very clear. So he was a young man who was far, far ahead of his time. He was not comparable to anybody in the post-independent Kenya. Uh, something else I want to talk about is Boya's weaknesses. Uh, first, Boya was a very, very tough debater, very tough campaigner, a very strong person, and very energetic, full of life, full of energy. All that you require. But that could also have marked his weakness because he would mock his competitors very badly to an extent that there were fears Kenya would have a civil war 
if Kandu refused to accept the 1963 elections, because Boya was really the only one who knew the language of mocking the opponent and reducing them into something little, something little. Now, in a young nation, this can be seen as a weakness, and to some it is still strength. But largely, that is to me a weakness, because when you overdo something, when you become a, a diehard in anything, you lose it all. You are likely to lose it. What if you lose it? You lose very badly because you are too much in it. There was no room for making friendships. He had really uh, played a very crude and shrewd political style that would have that ensured the victory of Kanu. So it is Boya more or less who really made Kanu to whitewash Kadu from the leadings that made. Tomboya was particularly notorious in mocking his competitors. That's what I've said. Okay? Uh, uh, and development that would evoke bitterness and thwart the idea of promoting a democratic culture. As Jeremiah Nyaga in his memos talks of Boya, especially with regard to the 1963 elections, he was notorious, to use Nyaga's words, Boya was notorious in stoking political fires. Very daring man. As Honorable Nyaga and Honorable Dr. Gikonyo Keano were busy delivering reconciliation speeches in January 1963, when they were preparing for uh, the, the election that came in May, from that took place between 18 to 26 May 1963, Tomboya was all over, all over, mocking or holding charged political rallies. Yes. Boya, the Kanu Secretary General in January 1963, was, uh, would be at Ipumwani supervising political games against Kandu, Kenya African Democratic Union, the opponent of Kenya African National Union, so Kandu and Kanu. So that was Tom Boya now at that time. And according to Jeremiah Nyaga's book or memo, uh, Boya would move with all the energy from morning. He had a lot of extra energy in politics. From Pumwani to Botera, okay, holding charged political rallies, boasting that one can do office after the other. From Pumwani to Botera were voluntarily, voluntarily becoming offshoots of Kanu. There were fears that neither Kanu or Kadu will accept a electoral outcome if either lost the elections. Those were the fears people had, that none of these parties is going to, uh, to accept the outcome. The electoral campaigns of January 1963 thus were geared towards the general elections that were held in Kenya colony between 18 uh, to 26 May 1963, where voters elected members of the House of Representatives and Senate, that is the bicameral parliament that obtained in Kenya at that time. To this end, the leading Kenyan newspaper, uh, the Sunday Nation, in its first edition of January 1963, splashed the names of 21 men, 21 men, troublemakers, no women troublemakers those days. Maybe unlike today, when there are so many troublemaker women, politicians. And so those 21 men were like being warned by the Southern Nation that Kenya is under your hands. If we have bloodshed, it's you to be blamed. So the Daily Nation in its editorial asked people in the first edition of January 1963 to choose between prosperity or bloodshed. You cannot have the two. One will come, the other one will disappear. The editor went on to invite them, the 21 troublemakers, or people who are likely to cause trouble, not necessarily troublemakers, but people who could cause trouble, or who were responsible enough to do something. They were advised by the editor to put an end 
to the tension that was mounting in the country. All these were caused by Thomas Joseph Boyer. Of course, they mentioned even harm, harmless people like Edward Kasakala, Musa Marebe, Taita Otowet, Justice Oretipis, Jean Marie Seroni, Wafura Wambuke, Paul Gay, Wata Ondede. All these people are mentioned. Even Yaga himself was mentioned. Though even Keanu, even Waikibaki, even Kadiuki Njiri, they were mentioned, yet the trouble makers were known, the rubber rousers. Boyer reading them. Now, Boyer's strength in countering ethnic configurations is also known. He had extra strength in countering ethnic uh, balkanizations. That's why it's very relevant for the Kenya of the 21st century. In the case of a tough contest for the then Nairobi East parliamentary seat, now Kamokonji constituency, which pitted Boyer against Dr. Munio Weyaki, who was learning a chemistry shop and a hospital in Nairobi city center, and growing popular through his medical practice as an African so educated in that, in the medical field, and doing better or just like his European counterpart. Boya emerged the winner against Munua Wayaki. But you note something, Boya got over 30,000. Uh, well, Dr. Munio Wayaki got about 3,000 votes. Uh, but uh, as I was talking to an eyewitness, one Muse who was working with the East African Industries and a voter in that area, Muse Peter Nyamukaveo, he once told me this that he almost saw Wayaki beating uh, Boya as a contest mounted because. Dr. Iyaki noted that there were more Kikuyus, people from his own ethnic group, than Boya. So he tried very hard to uh, exploit ethnic kind, and it was working for him. Because Boya was so busy moving across the country, Iyaki was overtaking Boya. But the last minute, Boya came back, and through his charisma, overturned Iyaki's win within a fraction of, say, a week or so, Boya had gotten back the votes that he was about to lose to Iyaki, according to Muse Nyamo Kaveo. And that is all about uh, the charisma of uh, Boya, which cannot be matched in post-colonial Kenya. We are not sure whether we are such a person those days. It's very hard to talk about a Kenyan matching Boya. Yes, not possible. Somebody's calling 92% of the votes when there is a very strong candidate from a member of the dominant community in a constituency. That is not a person we can take lightly, a person who knew how to reach people. Oyaki is said he even lost in his own, uh, to Boya in his old, own voting uh, center. Boya beat him. And this is courtesy of Boya's charisma. Of course, Woyaki came later and won when he moved to another constituency and avoided Boya. But he had tested the charisma of the most charismatic leader in independent Kenya. Yes, Boya's appeal to the Kenyan, Kenya first and Africa first, actually paid dividends. And that is what made him such a great man. Let me just comment a little about the impacts of Tomboya in post-independent Kenya. I've mentioned some, but let me comment. One is Jamhuri Day ce celebration of 1964. During, as Kenya prepared for a republic status, uh, that was to take place on 12th December 1964 under Kenyatta. Jomo Kenyatta is the first president. Before then, he was a prime minister from June 1963 to now December uh, 1964. Boya was made the director of national celebration because of, because of his organizational skills, his management skills. He had studied in UK, South Africa, and other places. 
Boyer was made the national director of the national celebrations. So, and uh, he invited Simeon Nyachai to be his deputy. Uh, the, the Simeon Nyachai was a district commissioner in Yandarwa, was deployed as a district commissioner of Nairobi in one of the 41 very critical districts of the then Kenya. And in his memos, Simeon, Simeon Nyachai says, I was transferred to Nairobi to work under the late Thomas Joseph Boyer as deputy director for national celebration domiciled in the then Constitutional Affairs Ministry as Kenya became a republic in December 1964. So I worked under Thomas Joseph Boyer. Now in these same memos, uh, Simeon Yachai, uh, who deputized Boyer, as pioneer planners of the first Jamhuri Day celebration of 12 December 1964, he describes Boya as someone who was committed to his work and had the gift of absorbing issues quickly and giving out well thought out intelligent feedback and that at no time did he see um, Thomas Boyer in panic. At no time did he see a panicking uh, Boyer. He was never panicking. He was a bit stable man. He, was, he never saw him frustrated as they planned uh, the very difficult Pioneer Jamuhuri Day celebration. He appeared calm, always calm, a very calm man. And Nyachai went on to describe his colleague in planning the national celebration as one like no other, and says that his killing or his assassination on 5th July 1969 is one of his saddest moments, and he felt that was the saddest moment for Kenya, as the best of the very best had been taken away uh, unprecedentedly, the best of the best. Something else, in 1965, Boyer presented in Parliament the sessional paper number 10 in April 1965. Uh, so the first sessional papers are papers that are presented in Parliament. Before 1921, almost all important government documents were presented to Parliament for their consideration. So Boya in this case presented the session of paper number 10 for debate in Parliament in April 1965, covering the period between 1964 to 1970, under the title African Socialism, Socialism and its application for planning to planning in Kenya. And uh, Boya co-authored this session of paper number 10 of 1965 with Mwaiki Baki, more or less his deputy in the Ministry of Economic Planning. The session of paper number 10 of 1965 aimed at promoting political equity, social justice, human dignity, freedom from want, disease, and exploitation, equal opportunities, and high and growing income per capita, as well as equitable distrib distribution of wealth or resources and services. The session of paper addressed colonial inequalities, which were basically defined to as uneven distribution of resources, both materially and in terms of services themselves. By equity, the session of paper is comparable to the Black Economic Empowerment, BEE, a policy that was adopted after the demise of apartheid in South Africa. So it's a question of looking at who are more marginalized. Yes, that is what it was all about. Uh, although it largely employed a capitalistic model, Kenya's session of paper of 
1965 compares with other models of African socialism such as Ujamaa, Kaunda's humanism and Nkrumah's conscience 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 Zambian humanism for example was based on a combination of mid 20th century ideas of central planning stroke stroke state control and what he considered basic African values, mutual aid and trust, and loyalty uh, to the community. Rooted in African indigenous society, where injury to one is injury to all, Kenneth Kaunda or the Zambian humanism emphasized on the belief in God, the supreme being. So that's something also very critical that also Boya was also a believer in the sense that he also invoked God in the very many things he attended to. Just like Kaunda, Nkrumah's conscientism can be described as the philosophy and ideology of attaining socialism. It formed a framework of his political action. So. Uh, you can see that the session of paper of, of April 1965, where Mboya had a huge input, if not the core other, compares with all those Nkrumah's consciousness and Kaunda's humanism. They compare very, very clearly. And that's why now, after independence now, we see Mboya becoming the minister under Jomo Kenyatta now, Prime Minister. The new Prime Minister uh, made him the Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs. A post is held from 1st June to 1963 until December 1964, after which he created the National Social Security Fund, Kenya's Social Security Scheme. He also established an industrial court to hear rainbow management cases. Such things took place. Uh, concerning his assassination, we say that uh, the man had returned from Ethiopia. Yes, he had returned to Ethiopia when an assassin hit him in a chemist shop in Nairobi. Yeah. Okay. And that was the Sunday's day for Kenya. After that death of Boya, the killing of Boya, an outrage over his assassination led to riots in the major cities of Kenya. President Jomo Kenyatta gave a eulogy at Boya's Requiem Mass, saying of his colleague, he said, Kenya's independence would have been seriously compromised were it not for the courage and the steadfastness of Tom Boyer. So that is the actual summary of Boyer. And it is very clear and very correct. A statue of Boyer was installed on Moy Avenue where he was killed and the nearby BC Victorian Street. Victoria Street was renamed Tom Boyer Street in his honor. And uh, so Boyer left a wife and five children. He left a wife, Pamela, and he was buried in a mausoleum on Lusinga Island, Western Kenya, or Nyanza province, the former Nyanza province. Uh, uh, that mausoleum was built in 1970, a year after. Something else. So we have noted that from Ethiopia to death, that is, on the morning of July 5, 1969, Tomboya, or President Kenyatta's Minister for Economic Planning and Kanu Secretary General, arrived at Embakasi's, I mean Nairobi's Embakasi Airport from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where he had been attending a meeting of the Economic Commission for Africa. In Ethiopia, Mboya was accompanied by his Permanent Secretary for Economic Development and Planning, Philip Dego and his brother, Alphonse Okuku Diege. 
he had dropped them off at his office and then before 1 p.m. he went to Chinese pharmacy on government uh, uh, avenue now, Moy Avenue, to buy some lotion for his dry skin. And uh, after chatting with Mrs. Moni Semi Chani for a while, Boya stepped out of the shop. That is when he was shot dead. Now, the last thing is to talk about Boya's personal life. Tom Boya married Pamela Odende on January 20, 1962, at St. Peter's Crevas Catholic Church on Lescos Road in Nairobi. So he was about uh, 32 years. Pamela, a graduate of the University of Makerere, was the daughter of politician Walter Odende. They had five children. Their daughters are Maureen Odero, a high court judge in Mombasa, as we talk in 2023, Susan Boyer, a Coca-Cola executive, and who continues the education airlift program initiated by Tom Boyer, and is married to former Nairobi governor, Evans Kidero. Their sons include, included Lucas Boyer, Peter, and Patrick. His wife, Pamela, died out of a newness in January 2009 while seeking treatment in the Republic of South Africa. Now, the last section is to talk about Tom Boyer's book, published in 1963 when Tom Boyer was nearly 33 years old. Let me talk about it. In his book, Tom Boyer, Freedom and After, published by East African Education Publishers, Nairobi, 1963, Boyer admits that it is after the arrest of Jomo Kenyatta and team on 20th October 1963 that he thought, as a young person, that he and other youthful people had a chance to chip in and fill in the gaping holes in the country. To stop the national movement, he says, he felt that their law as a young people was critically needed, not to stop, rather to strengthen the national movement that had been begun by the elderly people like Jomo Kenyatta. So, he says in that book, I felt incensed at the way the arrest of KAU leaders was done. I felt excited at the thought that we young people had an opportunity to play our part in the nationalist movement so that we could ensure that it did not collapse. In his 12th chapter book, uh, which is indeed a memo, you know a young man at 33 writing a memo, that is not common, so it was ahead of his time. It's like he had a premonition of death or what? and which he released when he was at that age, I've noted that three, he talks like a 70-year-old man who makes powerful recollections of his past and also a very clear grasp of the future. It shows a young man who had a very clear grasp of the future. He looks 70, not that three. Although he does not mention his teenage marriage to Margaret Ogweno, who was 22 when he was 23, and got one daughter with him before they parted ways, he pours out his heart in that book in a manner that makes him a knowledgeable father figure. In particular, he recalls that due to standing in missionary schools, he had at one time contemplated becoming a priest. This compares with his friend Kwame Nkrumah, who once contemplated becoming a Jesuit priest in the Catholic hierarchy 
At Lincoln University, USA, Kwame Nkrumah completed a Bachelor of Theology in a degree in 1942 at the at the top of the class, and later completed a Master of Arts in Philosophy. All these are preparatory preparation for his seminary life. Like Boyer, he did not become a church priest as he got too much involved in politics, particularly after listening to orators of Marcus Garvey's oriented African pioneer movement at Harem Street in the US, when he would come out of uh, the, the seminary, he would hear people talking good politics. That drew him to politics more than now to becoming a priest. Now, uh, the first chapter in Boyer's book uh, covers his early days where he, uh, he tackled several themes, including his days as a president of the student body, which shows his talent at that early age. His idea of becoming a priest, church and politics as a, as a theme, missionary failures, he analyzes it there, and uh, strength, failures and strength, among other things. And uh, he's very honest in those dealings, and uh, we wonder what kind of a wise man he was. He's very balanced in his argumentation. In the second chapter of his book, Boyer talks about his trade union activities and leaderships. He's brushing with racism in colonial Kenya, and so on. In chapter three of his book, he writes about Mau Mau movement and wonders. Was violence avoidable? Of course, he, he blames so many factors for it, mainly the colonial regime, including the COVID, uh, the COVID reports that said a lot of inaccurate, gave inaccurate information or report about Mau Mau and uh, other things. He also talks about land issues in chapter 3 and other causes of Mau Mau. He also writes about airlift matters, where he single-handedly linked up with Martin Luther King and U.S. President J.F. Kennedy in taking Kenya and other African students to the American students, to the American universities, so that they can later return, the, student, the Kenyan students will later return and serve in post-colonial, then envisaged post-colonial Kenya. Something else, is that uh, in chapter four of Boyer's book, Freedom and After, he talks about the national mobilization through the mass movement. Here, he admits the suspicions between uh, various ethnic groups, including Kikuyu and Luo, the challenges that he had encountered during his contest with Dr. Moyaki in 1962, when they uh, they contested the, the, the present day Kamukunji seat together and he beat Woyaki in a situation where most of the voters were Kikuyu from Woyaki's um, uh, community and scored 92% when Woyaki got 8%, or about 3,000 votes, as opposed to Boyas, over 30,000 votes. The fourth chapter also discusses the British obstacles to the national unity. He blames the British that they could have done better than that. He comes out with creative ways of combating negative ethnicity, which shows that he was the best leader who was well set to counter any form of ethnic balkanizations. Not, I don't think there's any other man who could have tackled it the way this book shows Boyer comes out as the one, the actual person, the de facto leader of tribes Kenya. Uh, in his fifth chapter, Boyer talks about the challenge of national building. He raises pertinent issues such as such as how free can press be, how free can the freedom of press be handled? His argument is, if we mishandle it, we have no nation. If we donate, we also don't have a nation. So it's very realistic. He also brings out the role of universities, 
why we need one, why a country without universities has no foundation and no future. And when you don't fund universities properly or take care of them, you also don't take care of the future. That is Boyer. He also talks about in his chap fifth chapter the partnership and the hypocrisies that are not necessary for a growing nation that we should avoid. He also talks about he also talks about the test of citizenship and mixed marriages. How far should they go? In fact, he had no problem with it. In fact, he was encouraging it. In the sixth chapter of the book, Boyer addresses both the failures of the previous colonial government and the possible challenges in the post-independent Kenya. He also addresses expatriate blackmail, the praise of walkout, the praise of demonstration, the praise of boycott, the crisis of confidence, and the importance of timing and scheming, among others. He would say there are things that you must be timely. There are things that don't wait, and there are things that can wait. Very realistic. In Boyer's seventh chapter of his book, Freedom and After, he pragmatically notes that preparation for Kenya and African independence badly needed is badly needed preparation. Okay? And uh, he talks about student airlifts, adult literacy campaigns, which he says they should be increased. Don't stop adult literacy. These people are not given education by the colonial government. They should not stay in the village, literate, illiterate. He also talks about the teaching of civics in schools, replacing expatriates with the local Africans who are qualified, not just replacing, but well trained to handle the job. The shaping of civil service and the army. He also talks about, or rather appreciates, what he called the wide role of women. He says the role of women is all wide. So it was certainly the end of his time. In a patriarchal society, Boya would see the wideness of women role in a patriarchal society. All this shows how Boya's, Boya at that three was so conversant with what means, what Kenya needs. So he took Kenya as his growing child who needed a balanced diet and genuine care across the various domains of life. So now, in Tomboya's eight out of 12 chapters, uh, in his eighth chapter, he dwells on African socialism again. Here, he contrasts Ujamaa and his more capitalistic-minded African socialism. Both are African socialisms, both Ujamaa and Boya's uh, version was African socialism, but it's different with that of Nyerere, of course, uh, of his uh, capitalistic leaning, though, he, though not very elaborate. Yeah, that's where they differ with Nyerere. His African socialism differs with that of Nyerere as he does not encourage nationalization of government-owned institutions. He also identifies Kenya's special problems. Okay? Kenya's special problems. In his ninth chapter, Boya identifies what he called neo-colonial threats as a failure to consolidate our freedom. In this, he wonders, what price should we pay in associating ourselves with Europe? He voices for economic development through African Development Bank and more regional planning. So he could say that if we want to develop Africa, we need to harness regional integration. We need to harness on African resources, even if it's an issue of creating or strengthening African Development Bank so that it can serve African interests without necessarily enslaving people, impoverishing people through exorbitant interest rates. That it was Boya arguing that way. And uh, that is, what, according to him, that was his way of consolidating freedom. You cannot consolidate freedom, according to Boya, without economic empowerment. And not necessarily through the UN, 
as a channel. So you would say if you want to bring Africa up front, to take Africa up front or Kenya up front, you need to build faith on our local resources and utilize it patriotically and uh, scientifically and carefully, all that. In Boya's 10th chapter of the book, Freedom and After, which I said is like his manifesto, which he did not really implement as he did not, as he did not become a president, at that age of that degree, he deals with the workers' right, and he draws from the various corners of the world, especially in the rest of Africa and Europe, to demonstrate how workers should be handled after freedom. He insists that workers cannot be undressed casually, as their horizons are too broad that than we may be tempted to think. The workers mean everything to any nation. You underlate them, you underpay them, you suck them the way you want, you harass them. You are risking the country, you are putting the country in danger. In any nation, Boyer argues, workers must be prioritized. In Boyer's 11th chapter, he urges Kenya and the less of Africa to consider looking out ones, what is called looking out ones. Yeah? Africa, Kenya, you must look out ones. And this, was, this is where his Pan-Africanism comes back. That is, as in Krumah's view, Africa cannot be free unless all are free. Yeah? In fact, in that chapter, chapter 11, is a very climatic, climactic one because he even frets with that idea of even invading the then upper then South Africa. Yeah, in any way, you can invent. You cannot be free when some people are slaves within your own country. It cannot be such a freedom. And the bit he invites his readers to explore on. He also emphasizes on building African federations as a way of what he calls looking out ones. So looking out ones in Boyas uh, is part of his foreign policy. I say in his book is like a manifesto that was not implemented. Uh, it was not implemented before he died. But it is so pragmatic, so practical. Uh, the last chapter now, the 12th chapter in Boyas, the 12th chapter book, the book is Freedom and After. He talks about as a title of the chapter as Africa and the World, which is a continuity of 11th chapter, where he talks of uh, reaching out. Here, he locates Africa within the Commonwealth in the framework of the American aid, the Indian China crash, among others. Of course, today you would have talked about. Russia-Ukraine war, but here he talked about Indian-China crash of 19, 1960s and late 50s, uh, among others, and insists that Africa must cut new threats in the new dispensation. The new methodologies must be devised. So realistic. He also tackles sensitive matters, very sensitive matters, including the morality or the lack of it coming from outside the permissiveness coming to our youths, to our families, the breakdown of families. He talks about neutralism in the nuclear age. Can we be neutral in the age of neutral? In the age of nuclear, sorry. Can we be very neutral? We say, ah, we don't mind. We are Kenya. And yet countries are killing one another or staring at, you know, annihilation of human beings through uh, nuclear, because nuclear can break all of us. He also talks about external moral influences. He says there are a lot of influences from outside. Now we are talking of uh, same-sex sexuality, which is an external influence. He didn't mention it, but he says that there are dangers inherent in not being careful in external moral influences that come. You know, having been afraid of Martin Luther King, who was a moral leader in America, Boya in this chapter comes out 
as the moral leader of Kenya and tells, cautions that there are traditions of Africa we cannot, uh, we cannot ignore. We need some. They are very critical, even in uh, post-independence Kenya, to keep our morals intact. Not necessarily intact, but to keep our morals. And the future of Africa, among others. He could also say Africa's future cannot be tackled through one pillar of culture of culture, economics pillar, the religious pillar, uh, economic pillar, uh, the political pillar, the aesthetic pillar, the other pillar of culture such as kinship, that's family relations. Boya says you cannot tackle African problems, the Kenyan problems, without addressing all pillars of culture. You need them. That is Boya, a great man. So freedom and after is Boya's vision for Kenya and Africa. At that degree, he was far, far ahead of his time. Thank you very much.